Chopping Brew. What up, everybody? Welcome to Chopping Brew. I'm Chip Walton. I'm on my patio with the one and the only King. King. Jeremy King is in the place. Jeremy King, you may know this guy from past episodes of BTV, of Chopping Brew, or just being a kind of a all around badass. Jeremy King, real quick, tell the people what you do these days. Uh, these days, I am a head brewer at a company in St. Paul, Minnesota called Urban Growler Brewing. Uh, we've been going through a bunch of expansion and dropped in a canning line, so we've taken this place and have put beer into cans for the very first time. How's that going? It's, it's great. Yeah. It's gone very smoothly. I've had some cowbell that I like. Drink it up. So, king, king. But you're also still a home brewer and a mad scientist when it comes to thinking about home fermentation. That's true. You didn't forget your roots, did you? Never forget your roots. <laughs> I actually have a mead going right now, uh, just another 16 ounce oh, yeah. portion of mead, uh, threw some raspberries in it just this morning, mm. and uh, we'll see how it comes out, TBD. And we've got some other cool ideas for the future, Jeremy King and I do, but our good idea for this moment is drinking this beer, which is almost out, so I felt compelled to get him over here to help me deliver some tasting notes. It's a really random beer. Uh, I'm gonna tell you the story about it. We're gonna do some quick tasting notes. Um, first and foremost, it's hot as heck. We're in a closed up patio. We've turned, closed all the windows because there's people lawn mowing all around us. And we've got a work light in for this little extra like fill light that's making us beautiful. So it's hot as hell. And we're gonna try to get this over with as quickly as we'll, possible. We'll be glistening, it's gonna be great. But would you say that this beer is good for the situation? I think this beer is absolutely appropriate. I mean. <laughs> Why would you not be drinking a lawnmower beer when a lawnmower is running outside? Like, yeah. it's, it's the right way to do it. And forcing you to close up your windows on your studio. <laughs> so, what this beer is, you may remember I put out a video um, a little while ago. Brian Adams and I got to be on Fox 9 Morning News, our local news affiliate, to help promote Homebrew Con in early June. By homebrew standards, this is pretty elaborate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is this system called? Uh, this is the Brutus 10. It's a single tiered uh, infusion system. And for that shoot, M.A. Roscoe and photographer Chip Elmquist were like, can you have a couple of beers going? So Brian had a beer going in the basement in the badass brewery, all grain, of course. I'm gonna go ahead and add the Amarillo hops to the boil. We are home brewing some hazy IPA in honor of Homebrew Con that yeah. is coming to the Minneapolis Convention Center. I'm joined by Chip Walton, who is a beer lover, a former co-worker, and a <laughs> member of the American Homebrew Association. That's right. And I had a beer going on his back porch, and I decided to just do a kind of a quick thank you ma'am brew in a bag. Originally, I wanted to knock off something off the list that I'd wanted to brew for a while, and so just making up something. So I chose this New England-ish bitter from our friend Michael Dawson. He's got a column in the, in the magazine, The Growler. His idea with New English-ish bitter, New England-ish bitter, was basically a New England IPA type vibe, but lower gravity and lower alcohol. Um, so the recipe was Golden Promise, crisp malted oats, rice holes if you're doing it all grain, but I didn't bother with that since I was brewing a bag. Um, the thing was, because like M.A. and Chip the other chip needed some beauty shots. Um, this original recipe is no boil hops, just mashing the golden promise and the oats. All the hops go in at the very end and a dry hop. But for TV, they needed some video of hops going in. So instantly, this beer kind of went off the rails, and we had a brewer's cut of Amarillo. Lord knows how many ounces. I'm gonna guess three or four. You know, some. Yeah. The brewer's estimate. Yeah, Juno gave us these. You know, these are from uh, BSG Hops when they're doing their walkthrough and all of their what do they call it? Um, selection. So I just got this random. So we put a handful in at the beginning of boil, and then a handful again for a tease that MA needed to shoot. So at this point, now we've got a beer that's brew in a bag, mashed and been drained. Um, and has like two handful of hops when it's not supposed to have any hops. <laughs> I should also point out that this thing, it, I only mash it for about a half hour because we were in a hurry. So when it came out of that brew in a bag mash, it only had about 1038 um, gravity at that point, which was even low for the 1044 final that it would have had. All that's to say, as I, at the end of this 30 minute boil, 
Um, I bumped it up with some LME. So what happens is MA needs a shot, boom, handful of Amarillo. MA and Chip need another shot, another handful of Amarillo. We get it boiling, they get their beauty shots, we all hang out, they leave. I'm like, no reason to really truly boil this for 60 minutes at this point. So this thing only mashed for 30 minutes, only boiled for 30 minutes. At the very end of that 30 minutes, um, two ounces of this Equinot hop, which used to be called HBC 366 as an experimental. Equinot, I uh, got these from Yakima Chief Hops at the Pacific Northwest Homebrew Conference. Uh, so two ounces went in to Whirlpool, and then two ounces went in like three days later for dry hop. So there was no reason why this beer should have turned into anything that I'd keep. This usually would have gone down the drain at Brian's house, but I felt this weird, I was like, I feel it. I feel the vibe with it. Just talking to him. I know, the improvisation of it seemed like it was gonna work out. So when I brought it home and cooled it down in the fridge to yeast pitching temp, which I used the strain that they call juice, from um, Imperial Organic Yeast, which I've been led to believe is for these kinds of beers, these hazy New England beers. I tasted our sec uh, primer and I was like, thank God I did not dump this. It tasted really good then, good enough to keg, but I went ahead and threw in the second batch of Equinot. So what we ended up with is kind of this like hazy, uh, it was 1052 to 1009, so off the top of my head, five and a half-ish. Roughly. Yeah, and um, it's lost some of the hop at this point, but early on it was a huge pineapple, melon, strawberry bomb. I feel like now it's lost a little of that, and that sweetness of the oats, the malt, is kind of a little more front balance, which isn't optimal, but it is two <clears throat> months old. And the only reason it lasted this long is because I kept waiting to shoot a video. This should have been gone a month ago when I wanted to drink it. Such as life. So Jeremy King, hearing that story for the first time, what do you think of this beer? Well, I think this beer, uh, I think it is showing a little bit of age. Uh, some of the hops, some of the fruit salad notes, mm -hmm. uh, the strawberry and what, whatnot, yeah. has dropped off, but those tend to be pretty volatile things anyway. Uh, it's hanging on to a pretty solid orange-like flavor. Uh, I get a strong papaya as well, um, which is most likely coming from this Equinot. The beer itself is extremely smooth. The mouthfeel, it's just... It's like liquid butter almost. <laughs> but not buttery. But not buttery. Uh, do you think that's the oats making up almost a third of the grist? Or do you think that could be from that E strain that's meant to be a little hazy and kind of stick to things? Yeah, I think we've got actually a number of things going on. So I think that definitely the oats play a role. But the oats tend to leave a silky smooth kind of mouthfeel. Um, and a lot of brewers these days that are brewing these lighter sessionable uh, IPA like beers are uh, turning to oats to help give body uh, and, and just a, a smooth mouthfeel. The yeast definitely play a role as well. So if you look at the head that's going on here, uh, some of that's from the protein from the malt, but some of that is also uh, due to some, some yeast character, but it's, it's smooth. It feels right. <laughs> it feels right. I'm doing it right because it feels right. Now it's interesting because there's not many hops going in early on in this boil, so the bitterness in this beer is almost none. Like I get, my perception of the bitter in this is zero. Like I would, I would say there is none. Um, I wonder if that's partially because the haze has brought some of that out. Because early on, it was bitter. It, it not, you know, un, unenjoyably, but you know when you taste wort, like right after brew day, it's just, it has everything in it and it's just. Yeah, it's almost like a tea and it just. Right, like, and it's bitter and green. It tasted like that for a while. It dry hopped in primary uh, at about 90% fermentation, which I'd never done. So went still a little gravity to go, dipped them in, and then everything in the keg, which is also kind of, I don't think it's a first, but I usually do a true secondary. But I figured with a beer whose point was to be kind of hazy and a quick drinker, I went right into the keg. The time dropping some of this out has probably stripped some of that bitterness. That's entirely possible. But early on, this was for an accident, I would totally try to recreate it. I would probably try to recreate it in a way that didn't need the LME to bump it up into that 1050. I'd probably just do more Golden Promise or maybe even a, a secondary base grain. Uh, but I've actually enjoyed this. That's why, you know, I was like, holy crap, yeah. I'm so glad I didn't dump it into Brian's backyard after, you know, MA left. Um, I called it the hot mess TV beer for a while because it was just all these hot mess type of situations that made it 
but it's kind of a hoppy accident is what I really would call it. Well, we're in a hot mess right now, Dude, too. Like, in a hot I guess, mess. I am actually... Like, Maybe we just call it hop mess. One hop mess. <laughs> Hazy pale ale. It was funny because when we were shooting the, the segment with M.A., um... We kept changing like what it was called. Like she was like, "We're brewing a hazy pale ale. We're brewing a hazy IPA. <laughs> We're brewing a session IPA." It's like it's kind of all of those things. That's right. That happens a lot. Like change names. Yeah. I change recipes on the way to a kettle quite frequently. <laughs> so I, yeah. You know. Since like Dawson was the the origin of the bastardized, the unbastardized version of this recipe, I I did give him a bottle. He wasn't able to make it by, but he had some quick tasting notes, uh, fruit salad, hot candy, pineapple guava, hard candy, like lifesaver. Um, he says something else sweet, musk melon? I don't even know what a musk melon is. I almost Googled it and then I was like, maybe he's making it up and we should just leave it that it's way. It's Dawson. That guy knows his stuff. Yeah. Resiny fruit, bit of light toffee malt off the background, some piney hops, pretty damn hop centric, but not stupefying in strength, which I appreciate. So, like I said, three weeks ago, it was a a better candidate for a Hophead's beer. We're kind of getting towards the end of its life, but that's good because I guarantee you the next pull on it's probably going to empty the keg. But this is what you do when the news media asks you to brew a beer to promote Homebrew Con. Yep, you, you make it look good, and you, as many times as you got to do it, you do it. I'll include the link to Dawson's actual recipe and... Uh, within a recipe for what I did. I'll, I'll basically just lay out the accidental steps I took and maybe you can recreate it. But you can definitely find his original, uh, probably more tried and true recipe from the growler. Uh, short of that, man, it's time to go get some revival, some fried chicken and barbecue. Southern food. The guys with the lawnmowers are pulling off in their trailer, so it's time to open some damn windows. Yeah, that's our signal, Dick. Cut it out. <clears throat> I encourage you all to go take this recipe, take the straight recipe, and make your own mistakes with it. Good luck. Good luck. Cheers. And there's been a dog barking yep. the whole time. Donate to Chop and Brew so we can buy a studio with air conditioning and soundproof panels. It would help. And beagle puppies. <laughs> right, Elsa? Oh, Elsa? I thought. <laughs> Elsa! 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 <laughs> if any of you are ever taking pictures, sending pictures of a of a nice pint that you just poured for yourself. And like, you got buddies, you know, that are like out on the East Coast and you're like, yeah, but I got this, you know, uh, <laughs> take a fork and just give it a little swirl. <laughs> like, give it a nice fresh head on it. It's beautiful every time. Come here. It would have been Come better for someone to be like, that is crazy hoppy. Will you just say that just so I can edit it in? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Hold on, chat. I'll do it like it's fresh. <laughs> give me my fork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how about the ass end of a... Yeah, there we go. That works. <clears throat> That's what they call food styling. <laughs> uh, How's it taste? Whatever the camera needs, that's what you do. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Do it again. Is it crazy hoppy? Mm -hmm. Wow! That is crazy hoppy! Woo! This interview's over. I'm opening a window. Open a god dang window. You didn't forget your roots, did you? Never forget your roots. <laughs> King.